right, is that working? Okay, cool. That was that was quite the introduction. I don't know how serious this whole thing is going to be because kind of you know when you go through this process, it feels very serious and it feels very stressful. And then when you get done with it and look on the other side, you get a little bit of perspective. So I think you know today what I wanted to do was kind of first tell you the story of Util because it is quite the story. Um, and I think hopefully it's a story that um, some of you guys can identify with as entrepreneurs who are trying to start things here in Ukraine and at least see that these things are possible. Um, so I think we can run it pretty casual. It's a pretty small group. So if there's anything that pops up in the middle of this that you guys want to ask a question about, uh, feel free to do that. So I'm going to go through like 10 or 15 minutes of the story uh, and then we're going to do a Q&A and I guess a, a fireside chat kind of thing. Um, so feel free to feel free to jump in uh, whenever you want. So I wanted to first start off and thank the organizers for oh wow that came up um, for having me out here. I've actually never been to uh, Lviv and I've been coming to Ukraine for about 10 years, which shows you just how uh, insular you can be when you're going from Borspol to downtown Kiev, uh, and never venturing an hour to the uh, to the west to see something like this. So, thank you guys for for having me out here. It's been kind of a, a very perspective expanding uh, event. So, I called this talk uh, the outsourced CEO because, in many ways, that's kind of exactly what I was uh, in this whole process. Uh, and this conference has been about you know, outsourcing. And I think, you know, the usual perspective of Kiev or of Ukraine is from outsiders looking in to do something. Uh, and I kind of wanted to invert that perspective for you this morning and say what it would be like to look inside and out or inside out. Um, and so kind of the, uh, the Amerikansky uh, in Kiev and the experiences that I had. So this up here is a picture of, it's part of the team uh, that ended up going over uh, in the acquisition and kind of rightfully so. I'm kind of like placed on the outside here and you can barely see me. Um, these are the guys who did uh, all the work and oddly enough, one of them is actually here, uh, which, is, which is Alex in his, in his younger years. Um, Alex was the head of research at Vutil uh, and if you guys have any questions later, he actually you know, went to school uh, in Kiev, did the full cycle, went to the startup that was you know, in Ukraine, ended up getting his green card and working at Google for a couple years. So, you know, if anything, kind of the main takeaway from what I want to tell you guys is, you know, it might be a hard journey, it might be kind of the ups and the downs, it might look impossible, but it actually is possible. Um, and, you know, like the introduction mentioned, that there's, you know, only been a couple of these. I think that although there's only been a couple, the market here is actually not that big. Uh, and the fact that you've had a couple um, really shows that you can develop this uh, and at the end of the day that it, that it is possible. Um, so this is to kind of skip to the end of, I guess, why all this matters and what makes it serious is, you know, we ended up raising a bunch of money uh, and then selling for, a, you know, a fairly decent amount of money uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and so this was in 2012, the largest venture backed exit in the history of Ukraine. Uh, which is either kind of a really good thing for me or a really bad thing for the country, meaning it's not all that big, but um, I think it, like I said, as a proof point, uh, is significant. Um, so the story of Butyl uh, is that uh, kind of in early 2009, there was a graduate student named Andrei Seryov who was uh, at a local school in Kiev, and he had drawn some equations on a board. And the equations described uh, a new way to go and do face detection uh, and face recognition uh, in frames of video. Um, and when I say this was kind of like a pitch on a board, it was really a pitch on a board. Um, it wasn't slides. It was him, a couple other PhD students sitting in a room um, saying that we think that we can do this. Um, and why, you know, I think that this is significant is the first is that it's kind of pure technology. Um, this wasn't something that was, you know, going to be this consumer product or, you know, have a ton of revenues. This was something that we knew from the very start was going to take a lot of money and a lot of time um, to actually develop, and it wasn't going to be easy. Um, and as we saw over the next, you know, about four years, uh, it proved a little bit harder than we thought. Um, but if you, if you look at this, it, this is, you know, this was the first deal that the university had done uh, to really license the technology out uh, in a commercial sense. Um, and so I think that was a very, very good proof point uh, early on that there is world-class research going on uh, in these universities. You just have to find it. 
Uh, and then on the second side of this, um, especially this many years ago when the market was not as developed, this is kind of like a quintessential VC kind of thing, right? Um, we, we would need, you know, what turn out to be tens of millions of dollars uh, to get this work. Uh, and if you look at Ukraine back then, it's like, where are you going to go get that much money uh, on a pitch of equations on a whiteboard? Um, so this leads you to Silicon Valley. Um, and so we kind of packaged this up, came up with a pitch and said, we have this you know, fantastic technology. More importantly, we know all the people that we can go and hire to actually do this because they were in this university lab, uh, but we're gonna need some money to do this. Uh, the first money into the company actually came from some Ukrainian American uh, kind of guys who had made money who were wealthier and gave us a couple hundred grand to, to get everything going and that left it up to the VCs. Um, and so, we, we pack up everything and we head to Sand Hill Road and the first thing you get is, where in Russia is Kiev? Um, you know, I think kind of giving you, it, this has changed a lot just because of the headlines that you see about uh, Ukraine, but you know, back then, the kind of perception of where Kiev was, what it was, you know, for an American it's like, the, here? Like that's kind of the level of specificity that you get. Um, and you know that it's, you know, something to do with Russia, um, but kind of just like an off the map uh, type of place. And, you know, throughout this conference, what we've heard is kind of, you know, how do we make uh, Kiev into like the next Silicon Valley? How does Ukraine become the next Silicon Valley? Um, a lot of people are still asking where it is. So kind of just like set your expectations of, you know, where we are uh, in this cycle. There's still a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to be done. I think the, this, the other thing to keep in mind uh, is, you know, in California, San Francisco is Silicon Valley. They view Los Angeles as a secondary market, meaning Los Angeles is a long way for a lot of these guys to go. And so when you think like, this is gonna be easy to get VCs here, or they're gonna come here, a lot of them don't even wanna get on a plane to go to Los Angeles, and that's an hour flight. Um, so we had our pitch, we're running into all these things, we're pitching literally anybody all over the world, and you know, we're pitching a very famous British investor, and his response was, Kiev is too far away. Uh, so Kiev is like a couple hour flight uh, from London at the time, and this was entirely discouraging. And we're like, you know, can, we even, can we even get this done uh, at this stage? We're not getting much interest. And then we show up in Los Angeles, uh, and a guy named Bill Woodward said, let's get on a plane. So, you know, between the first statement and the second statement, I think it captures kind of the magic of Silicon Valley and the magic of California, and that there are guys who are willing to take a risk uh, and be this kind of like cowboy venture capitalist, get on a plane and go and do something. Um, but I think you really do have to find them. Uh, and regardless of how much you pitch, you know, how close Ukraine is uh, to the rest of the world, you're really gonna have to find uh, investors that are comfortable going uh, and doing this. So this is kind of like the funding stack that we ended up having. Uh, at the top, we have the angels who did this kind of out of the kindness of their own heart, maybe even a little bit of charity. Uh, the Series A was done by Anthem Ventures, uh, and we raised 2 point, like 2.5, 2.7 uh, from these guys. And between the angels and the Series A, that got us about the first uh, year and a half of our operations. <clears throat> and then we went and did a very large Series B, which ended up being closer to $15 million um, from a variety of different guys, some strategics, some traditional uh, venture investors. Uh, so all told, we ended up raising uh, about $18 million uh, into the business over the course of four years from start to finish. Um, and you kind of, you know, you go through, you know, the highs where you get kind of like your obligatory uh, TechCrunch article here. Um, and then, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, this like typical uh, curve of what a startup life is like. It's like, you know, fantastic when you have the pitch and you get some traction. And then this trough of sorrow ended up being about three years for us. Um, you know, one of the challenges with having this pure technology was we weren't driving users, we weren't driving a ton of revenue, we had people, right? And we had people and we were working on important technology and we had to go and pitch that believe in the technology, um, we can actually go and do this. And I think, you know, when looking at some of the challenges that <clears throat> local startups face is that you either have, you know, traction or the dream. Uh, we didn't really have traction, we had the dream. Uh, and the dream was pure technology. Um, 
So after we got through the, the trough of sorrow, we went from being server side to desktop to mobile, this kind of you know, very long journey of going from four employees up to close to 100 employees, back down to 20 and then to 40. All of a sudden, the gates of heaven opened. The technology starts to work. Mobile phones are becoming more popular. Everybody's taking a picture. And oh, wow, there's this group in Ukraine that can do real-time face detection, real-time face recognition. And almost all of a sudden, we had interest from a couple of different parties. But it wasn't just that easy. Um, you know, when you're going through these processes, you hear all these kind of like, you know, these like um, off-the-shelf advice. And this, this one struck me as kind of the most wrong thing that we heard, was that uh, companies aren't sold, they're bought. Uh, and this is kind of like the, the standard advice of like, keep your heads down, work on building great technology, building a great team, and then the buyers will just materialize. Well, for Vital, this wasn't the case, right? We'd spent three and a half years, close to $20 million. We, didn't have, we couldn't wait for the buyers to come to us, we had to go to them, uh, which means that you know, we weren't going to raise any more money. It would have been incredibly dilutive, uh, even if we could have gotten it. And so we really had to go and say, now is the time to sell a company. The tech is working. Uh, the market looks like it's coming together. Now let's try to go and sell it. Uh, so we hired the investment banker. And the job of the investment banker is they take you around town, um, introduce you and say, oh, this company you know, is evaluating its options or something like this, some code for they need to sell. Um, one of the most interesting things in the sales process was we didn't take anything for granted. Um, so we had a team of researchers, um, and Alex can attest to this, that we would you know, run basically training sessions um, of how to do the interviews, how to talk about yourself, how to pitch the company, because when the buyers would come over and do diligence, they would kind of sit with every single engineer, interview them, and they really wanted to make sure that they could communicate with these guys and they could see them on their team. Uh, so we spent a lot of time and effort to make sure that we kind of educated our employees of how to talk about the business uh, and how to be comfortable. So at the end of the day, um, we ended up with a competitive process that lasted about six months between uh, Intel and Google, where we saw the price go dramatically up. Uh, we were able to close the deal with Google Motorola. Um, and they moved over, it was 36 engineers uh, plus their families. And if you ever want to like, if you ever hear all these stories like how hard it is to get green cards and everything in the US, uh, for a company that's as powerful as Google, I think it was you know, basically two months before everybody had all their visas and were moved over. Um, and it was, ended up being close to 100 people uh, with their families that made the trip. Um, switching gears kind of into some of the lessons learned and you know, try to make it a little bit more specific of, of what the takeaways might be from this story. I, the very, very first uh, is structure. Um, and so when I'm looking at deals in Ukraine kind of from the investor perspective, you first look for how the company is set up. Um, and it's very, very important that you get this right um, from the very early stages. Otherwise, it's gonna make it very difficult to raise money uh, moving forward. Uh, and what this means is kind of, first off, and I know this is kind of like this is some of the tendency with the smaller deals, is like you can't do the cash thing. Um, the cash in the long run is very, very difficult to document, um, and it's prohibitive to later stage investors that might want to get into the deal. So my advice would be from the very start, set up the US company, do the rep office uh, here in Ukraine, and that solves a lot of your problems. So the money goes to the US company, gets invested there, then gets distributed to the rep office. Uh, it helps secure the IP, it helps clean up the money trail, and if you think you're gonna have to raise money at a later point, this makes it much, much easier to, uh, to go and do so. Uh, the second is, I, I say tech here, but it's really know your deal. Um, Vutil was a technology deal through and through. It was about getting the best people, the smartest people in the room, working on the technology. And at the end of the day, that meant it was a certain type of deal in that we needed basically venture capital because we weren't gonna be making a ton of revenue. Um, and so for us, the focus was the tech. And I think there's a sweet spot for Ukraine um, in these pure tech deals because you're not having to rely on a domestic market and you're also not having to really rely on understanding an international market. You just have to be sure that you can create world-class technology and then figure out the missing piece of how to get that tech uh, into the world. The other part that was incredibly important was scale and stability. Um, you know, Vutil was attractive to bigger buyers because it was a bigger team. 
right? So we had 40 guys who were together for four years. And like, yeah, it takes venture capital, it takes a lot of money to do that, but that ended up creating a lot of the value in the company down the stream was having these guys together and having a big enough team that could actually tackle these tough problems and do the research. Um, the fourth, and this is kind of, you know, I'll be speaking for myself here, it's kind of like what I think is really important because this is what I was doing, like the outsourced CEO, my job was first to make sure that we had enough money uh, into the business to support the structure, the tech, and the scale, and then fourth, to get it into the world. Um, so we were very aggressive in doing partnerships with big strategics like Qualcomm, Intel, uh, AMD, the big technology companies uh, in the Valley. And I think if you look at me in kind of this role as an outsourced role, it applies to a lot of different companies in Ukraine uh, in that you should look at somebody who can bring you over there, um, but you don't need to move your company over there. And I think you know, this is fundamental for me, especially when I'm looking at deals here, and everybody's like, I wanna raise this money so I can move to Silicon Valley. And it's why. Like, wh what are you gonna do? What are you hoping to achieve with this? You know, you're gonna go over there, it's super expensive, you can't hire, um, and you don't know anybody, why do you wanna be there? And the answer is like, oh, so we can be closer to our customers. There's other ways to do that. Um, and, I, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later on, you know, Silicon Valley is not kind of the place that, it, it, there's pluses and minuses to it, and it's not always the best place in the world to, uh, to build your business. Um, so my advice would be raise abroad, biz dev abroad, build at home. Um, you know, the reason that I come to Ukraine all the time uh, and why there's such interest in it is because you have massive advantages here on the ground in Kiev and Lviv and a bunch of other cities here that you don't have anywhere else in the world. You have a highly educated uh, talent base, you know, that is relatively inexpensive compared to a lot of other places. I always say that I'm not here because it's cheaper, I'm here because it's better. Um, and I actually think that that's true for me personally and some of the stuff that I work on. Um, but I think it's a perspective that you guys you know, need to have is that a lot of the advantages that you have are because you're here, right? And you gotta kind of play the hand that you've been dealt in all these things, but this is probably the best place for a lot of you to build your companies, right? To build the people of your companies, to build the big structure of your companies, to have the headcount than anywhere else in the world. It's the place that you know. It's the place that a lot of outsiders like me are coming to get talent, and it's the place that you have the biggest advantage. Um, so my advice is like, don't think you have to pick up and go somewhere. Um, you really can do something here, and I think you have a massive, massive competitive advantage uh, by being here. So this, you know, I'll tell you this, you know, I am originally from, you know, Dallas and I moved to California and I kind of came out there with this almost as like HBO, the show wasn't out of the time, but it's, you, know, you come out with like these Hollywood dreams of what all this stuff is going to be. Um, one of the things about the television show that makes it not funny is that it's so absurd and bizarre that it's almost true and it matches what you see in real life. Um, the second thing is, I, you know, Silicon Valley is set up as you know, this goal and the end place to be, where the realities are that you're probably not gonna be able to hire. Um, it's gonna be super expensive when you do. The housing costs are expensive. Uh, and like I said before, you're not gonna know anybody. And so you're gonna face this same problem of like, how do we break in? And it doesn't really matter if you're sitting here or sitting there, it's still gonna be challenging to break in. Um, and so I think like, when you're looking at this, look at it practically of like, Silicon Valley's out there, yes, it gets all the press, but that doesn't mean that that's the hand that you guys have to play um, or that you should play. And I think, you know, even for somebody like Alex who, you know, worked at Google, he's now back in Ukraine setting up his new company because he has specific advantages here um, that don't exist uh, in the Valley. These, these are actually pretty tough, um, especially for me to look at and, you know, I'm sure even harder for you guys to look at, but I wanted to put them up here because this is kind of like part of the reality that you have to deal with, especially if you're trying to go get venture capital. This one actually, um, I'm glad I was able to find it, actually when we were raising one of our rounds, this was the uh, Kiev Post that was in the hotel that our investors were staying at, right? First of all, with the Kiev Post, I actually don't know how they get away with publishing most of this stuff. Um, but this is the English language newspaper that is in all of the hotels um, that everybody that you're gonna bring to come look at your company is staying at. And we literally saw him walk in with this paper of, you know, nepotism, right? And like, you have to address this. There's no saying it doesn't exist. You know, this, this kind of, these series, you know, kind of put Kiev on the map for kind of all the wrong reasons, but you have to address this. Um, and I think that, 
you know, the way I've always looked at it is like, yes, these things are true, um, but these are kind of, you know, big macro level events. The reality on the ground is actually a lot different for the tech industry, meaning you guys are somewhat insulated from a lot of this stuff, but you have to admit this is part of the context. And, you know, my advice is not to shy away from this, not to say this stuff doesn't exist, um, but this is just part of Ukraine. This is part of the story. Um, it's not insurmountable, um, but it is here. Uh, and one of the, my kind of favorite expressions on this is perception arbitrage, meaning the perception that this kind of these salacious headlines create is something that is a lot worse than it actually is on the ground. Um, so I think this is, I think this is, you know, this is important because when you are raising money, when you are trying to do deals, these are the first set of questions that you're going to get. Um, and, you know, you kind of do have to, uh, you do have to address them. Let's see. So this is my last slide, and this is kind of, you know, kind of like the hope slide. And I, I really do believe this, and I think, you know, the trend is upward, is, is up. Um, so you see in 2010, this is from uh, the Ukraine deal book. You know, you've got, you know, about 20 deals, $30 million, and then you see 132 and 120 deals. Um, this is the reality of Ukraine, right? So you can go look at this, and you can say, oh, my God, the world is ending, nothing is happening. Like, yeah, it does affect it, but the market demand is such that it's going to bounce right back. And this will be, you know, from the left up and to the right for the foreseeable future. Yeah, there's going to be some more bumps in the road like this, but that's the reality. But, you know, at the end of the day, you guys are sitting somewhere where I want to be, where a lot of other people want to be. You have a ton of advantages here. There's no reason to have kind of this escapism attitude. Escape to what? Escape to Silicon Valley. You can build here, do your business development abroad. There's tons of people who want to help and work with Ukrainian companies uh, and view this as an opportunity. So build here, create your companies here. There will be more butyls. There will be more luxuries. Uh, it's just a matter of time. You know, honestly, having, you know, two that are kind of more public and probably five or six that are not so public out of this number is not a bad conversion percentage. Um, so this will go up, it will continue. So invest here, build here and find, you know, consultants and stuff like that to help you go to the Valley. Uh, and you'll kind of, if that's what the recipe for success is, that's as kind of as close as I can give you guys uh, now. So I think we're going to switch to some, some Q and A. Thank you.